Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom. My name is Eric. Yes. I'm going to uh, attempt to remember how to do this Killapalooza shit. Uh huh. And we're still calling it Killapalooza. Well, we're going to call it Killapalooza until it dies, which so, is what the end of this year. I believe never is okay. when that is. So one we've got uh, twelve of these now. Uh huh. I'm here with Michael. Yes, I I am here. How are you doing, Michael? You know, I'm just doing wonderfully. I have an ear infection today, so there's there's a moment where I'm sick. Finally. So today we're going to take a journey to Camp Arawak and uh-huh. other oddly named camps. Camp be a man and <laughs> man to be. And we're uh, we're going to talk about sleepaway camp. Mm-hmm. Oh, thank fuck! We are going to talk about sleepaway camp. I um I know I say this probably every time we do a Killapalooza, but I haven't been this excited to do a Killapalooza since Children of the Corn in a long time. No, since before Children of the Corn, Alien versus Predator. Since Children of the Corn set the bar at a new low, uh-huh. I haven't been that excited. This is uh this is a lot of firsts for us. Yeah. So this is a return to what feels like real slashers. Well, yeah, it's a return to 80s slashers where somebody, it's, you know, you get the first person kills. Yeah. You get a body count for a change. Sure. Remember when Killapaloozas used to be about body count? No. Yeah, there were once upon a time in the great old days of uh, year three, Killapaloozas were about body count. Yeah, I mean, we've been doing, you know, Wishmaster was probably, that sort of felt, no, not really. It, it was seemed too new. It just felt it too weird. new. That's the yeah. only, that was my problem with. And Wishmaster. Amityville was about a house. So really, after that, seemingly, you know, that never really felt wrong until I made the cover art for that show, and I literally we have these great cover Michael Myers, right? Yeah. And the even the Child's Play cover, yeah. you know, fucking Texas Chainsaw Leatherface on the cover. And then Amityville Horror, and it's literally a picture of a house. Yeah. I spent three hours trying to find a scary picture of that house. I debated putting the lamp. Should have put the lamp. I was so close to doing that. So we get back to uh, to the old slasherdom. But uh, also, we're talking about a female slasher today. Yeah, we are. And uh, while you let me forget this every once in a while, one of the, uh, the themes of Double Feature is female empowerment. Because uh-huh. why wouldn't it be? Right. And man, are we going to get to talk, uh, talk about a lot of that. The last thing that makes this unique is that we're going to cover a movie. This is first time for Double Feature, Kill mm-hmm. a Loser or otherwise. We're about to cover a movie among the five, a movie that does not actually exist. Right, and may never exist. That's really, really awesome. Yeah. So there's going to be some spoilers in here. But most of the times when you tune into a Killapalooza, you probably don't give a shit. Yep. It's, it's mostly about watching us struggle through finding pertinent information through... Uh... All of the films in the franchise. Ah, but not the case this time. There are very, very notable things. It's true. It's very true. You've all heard of Sleep. I mean, everybody's heard of Sleepaway Camp because it does some notable things. So one in particular. I think everybody's heard about Sleepaway Camp because the ending is one of the most spoiled things in popular cinema. Right. And so we're going to have to talk about that. You know what? If you haven't seen Sleepaway Camp and you're listening to a Killapalooza show, you will love, at the very least, do the, the, the least amount of work just watch the first movie, uh-huh. and that gets rid of our biggest spoiler. You'll have a fine time, yeah. and then we can move into the other stuff. If you haven't seen the first movie, just, I guess, if you've seen Unhappy Campers and Teenage Wasteland, the uh, Pamela <laughs> Springsteen gems, sure, sure. just you can chapter on over to two and three. Yeah, use the chapters to do that. I, we're going to have a hard time not... You know what I'll try and do? I will try and keep that spoiler in the first one. I, I can, think I can do that. It'll be difficult. Probably first and fifth. Yeah, maybe. You might want to skip the fifth one, too. So we're going to start with the first Sleepaway Camp, mm-hmm. which in the... What is that called? The Survivor Kit? Yeah, the Survivor Kit. Which one is that? That's the one with the knife through the shoe. Knife through the tennis shoe. Yeah. Excellent. It's the 1983 film, and this is something that's a little unique to the Sleepaway Camp films. They're all basically made by the same couple people. Yeah, well, there's two guys. There's Robert Hiltzik, who did the first one, and then he also came back and did Return to Sleepaway Camp. The fifth one. And then we have Michael A. Simpson and Fritz Gordon, who did Unhappy Cappers and Teenage Wasteland. So the first and the fifth are the same writer-director. Mm-hmm. Uh, Robert does both of them. And in thinking back to that first movie, and as we watched it, I'm trying to come up with, you know, what are the, the, the things that are going to stick out the most? Uh-huh. When you think back to some of these other series, especially going back to the first five or so Killapaloozas that we did, 
I can tell you which one is the the military child's play, uh-huh. and I can tell you which one is the Halloween in the hospital. Right. And so I'm trying to think, okay, as as we're going to go through each of these five sleepaway camps, how do you remember, you know, which mm-hmm. one uh, they are? And we always remember the first one because it feels like the first one. Sure. Always. The first one is always, it's pretty, it sets the bar, right? And and like I always say, the first film in a slasher franchise never knows it's the first film <laughs> no, in a slasher franchise. No, it has franchise. no fucking clue. And Sleepaway Camp is not, it's it's no exception to that rule. You have a bunch of kids running around a camp a la Friday the 13th, and then bad shit starts happening. With the exception of, there's kind of this weird aunt in the beginning. Yeah. Who is a, either a marvelous or terrible actor. But I, I, I mean, I'm going to just come out right now and say my favorite part of Sleepaway Camp is Paul D'Angelo who plays Ronnie at Camp Arawak. So what just totally does it for you? Uh, the pointing, the uh, the fact that there's there's a scene, okay, so there's a scene that I fully intended to point out, but half the time I miss it. If you're going through watching Sleepaway Camp, mm-hmm. in one of the scenes where Angela's cousin is being scolded by the owner of the camp, the sure. like, creepy old man, Yeah. so they're facing each other yeah. on uh, maybe like, you know, left half right half of the screen they're facing each other with about a one person gap in between them sure and if you look in the background ronnie is standing there facing the camera in the distance lifting dumbbells (laughs) with both of his arms like he's flapping his weightlifting wings and i didn't catch it when we were watching it i fully intended to find it but half the time i'm just too enthralled with these grotesque characters that always play the camp owners and counselors that i'd miss it yeah, you really start to feel some of the, uh, maybe the neglect that Friday the 13th tells you it's about. Sure. Where that's a franchise that has a bunch of camp counselors that at least Jason's mom would have you believe right. aren't very good. Right, where their priorities are promiscuity exactly. instead of the well-being of the campers. Exactly. This is just a, a collection of people who are kind of shitty at uh-huh. what they do. Right. It's weird seeing, and all of the films do this, which I think is one of the great staples, is these camps are terrible. Mm-hmm. And the owners of the camps, pretty much without exception, Possibly it gets a little hairy in the second in Unhappy Campers. Right. But the owner of the camps do not care about the kids. They are there to make money. And and that serves to prevent a widespread panic when kids start dying. Right. Kids will die and the counselors and the owners go, don't tell anyone. Sure. Because if you tell somebody... People will stop paying us money to go to the camp. Just get a new cook. I think that's really trying to highlight how shitty camp actually is. Yeah. I mean, it's almost satirical. It's uh, it's these collections of people, and camp's very bizarre in this way. Mm-hmm. Have you what, been to camp? I have. Yeah, okay, I see, was, I've never been to camp. Yeah, I was raised by a bunch of teenagers in the 80s. Which is where all my love of 80s culture comes from. Uh-huh. Mostly music. the All the fucking Duran Duran, right? Right. I just had nothing but that shit growing up. And the idea of camp is that parents have to feel very safe bringing their kids to it. And it has to seem, it puts on this uh, this show as if it's well orchestrated and very, very safe environment, somewhere you'd want to leave your kids as they grow up. Mm. However, it's just a bunch of teenagers who don't sure. give a shit about right. anything. Right. And so it's the, the, almost this, uh, this stage show that's happening, you know, as people are being dropped off. And then you get there and nobody fucking cares. It's barely held together. It's one of those things almost if you've ever walked into a business and just thought, how is this place in operation? Uh How do they stay open? How does this collection of idiots run this place? Right. That's basically what camp feels like. I mean, that's pretty much what this, what especially the first sleepaway camp movie feels like. You have a bunch of terrible people, one nice female camp counselor who Uh always coddles the lead. Sure. And, and Ronnie. Or a Ronnie-esque character. Uh, he's TC later on. But you just have one other nice counselor. And then a nice female counselor. And everybody else is a bitch. So I think you really hit it when you were talking about it being an 80s slasher film. Sure. And maybe even more so than our franchises, you really see this, you know, there with the Terror Train, uh, April Fool's oh, Day yeah. kind sure. of. Um, what's the one I always forget I watched? House on Sorority Row. <laughs> yeah, that one. It feels like one of those movies, and maybe not even necessarily a good one of those Mm -hmm. movies or a memorable one until we get to the end. Yeah. And that's what makes it memorable. So when I try and think about the body of this before that sort of twist happens, before that reveal happens, I think about it being not even so much the 80s in the slasher culture, 
but the eighties in the repressed homosexuality. Yeah. You know what I mean? I like, absolutely know what you we're mean. We're watching this. It seems like so much unintentional eighties. I, I don't know what else to call it. Eighties homosexuality. I mean, yeah, it's, do people it's, know what I'm talking about when twisted, I say that? It's a twisted ideology about homosexuality being uncomfortable and comfortable at the same time. Right. Where it's, it's almost, the comfortable part being the short shorts and the cut off tees. Right, or is that exactly. the uncomfortable part? No, I think, well, it depends on who's watching. It's just that there's this widespread acceptance of what would now be a clear, I guess, a ringer for homosexuality. Everybody just kind of dressed that way and acted that way. But I mean, the film kind of, I don't think it does it intentionally, but there's a lot of commentary on homosexuality. Angela's father. Right. Uh, she sees him in the bed with another man, the right. man who who heartfeltly cries, John, well, see, when this is... uh, John gets chopped up by a boat motor in the opening of the film. Yeah, I mean, this is how you know the rest of the movie isn't talking about gay culture. They're right. not trying to say anything because, you know, the point, the point where they do try to say something about it is so overt. Right. I mean, there's that scene, that flashback scene where they're just having it's the, this gay love cry fest. It's a cuddle fest in a twin bed. Something that is a feat in and of itself, let alone with two men. That's really what makes this movie notable. So I'm I'm wondering a lot about that scene and you know when we're finding out more about Angela towards the end and it's trying to tell us she's incredibly messed up. This is one of the things that they go back to and I don't know if I should scorn the movie for it. Because it's possible, and I guess this is really uh, what I'm wondering, what's the movie trying to say? Did that fuck her up? Did having two dads fuck her up? Because if the movie's saying that, like, fuck you, movie. Here's my answer to that, okay? So we have this opening scene where it shows a father, a son, and a daughter in a boat. Two of them die, and one child survives. Sure. Could be a boy, could be a girl. And then later on, we have a previous scene to that which is this flashback with yeah. her father and another man in bed she's maybe four probably younger sure three and a half four years old so she sees them in bed and she's giggling okay shortly after this she is told she's a girl she's mm-hmm. raised like a girl i don't think it's commenting on gay people beget gay children or gay people fucks kids up What I'm going to assert the film is doing is saying the only exposure to sex that she had was a man with a man. And that's why, as a girl, she still knows she's a boy and why she still goes on with that other boy. Yeah, I kind of follow you. Although I guess my concern is that the movie's trying to say this caused weird gender identity issues. And had she had uh, a male parent and a female parent, that she wouldn't have come out this way. I think that the... the, uh, gender identity issues came from her aunt who decided she was a girl i think the gender identity issues came from her penis but if uh you know if anything fucked her up parenting wise it was having that aunt seriously let's pause for a second (laughs) what the fuck is does she think she's on a a theatrical stage is that what's happening I, i my 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 guess always when there's an actor like that is producer's wife Honestly, that is always oh, my guess. Man. That's honestly that's starting to be what I think about Mia Jovovich every time I see producer's, her now. Wife. producer's wife. Yeah, if you haven't seen this, just her over the top gesturing and uh, the way she says her lines—it's all projected as yeah. if she's in a big, mate, a large theater. Every gesture is really grandiose, and it always. She puts her finger on her right. lip with every line. I mean, it's huge, though. It's yeah. fucking huge. It's not uh, someone acting like they're acting, but maybe even someone parodying that, uh, you know, acting as if they're an actor who's acting over the top. Right. It's ridiculous. It is. It's absolutely ridiculous. And if that's not over the top enough, there's something that there's another bone you have to pick with this movie that maybe what you think is a little bit too much. Well, look, I would never criticize Sleepaway Camp. I'm not going to tell it how to do its job. It's doing its job just fine. I love Sleepaway Camp. I wouldn't change a thing about it. Agreed. Fully agreed. Softball for 10 minutes. Yeah. Why are we playing (laughs) softball? There's a scene. This is so exploitation. Even exploitation movies wouldn't try and get away with this shit. And this doesn't tell you anything about any of the characters. It, there's a scene where they're playing softball, right? Uh-huh. And uh, this is kids having fun at camp, whatever. We're getting to learn who a couple of the people are for the first 20 seconds. Right. 
But this goes on. We watch their entire softball game. Yep. And there's really never any <laughs> point to it. It's like the movie was, oh, I don't know, only 61 minutes long. And they said, shit, how do we get another 15 minutes in here? Let's set up and then execute an entire scene of softball. Sure. Or I don't know, borrow the canoe scene from the Godfather. Yeah, right. <laughs> I think it's the second Godfather, right? Uh-huh. You see this canoe scene in a lot of places. And I don't know if it's just because Godfather 2 had the most memorable canoe scene and it was in the 70s, so it came first. Uh, I remember it being parodied in South Park as well. Anytime there's kind of creepy music, I wish I could remember the instrument that's being played. Uh, and there's kind of a bunch of mist on the water and two people go out in the canoe. You're thinking only one person's going to come back yep. in the canoe. Not the most memorable stuff, though. I remember the kills. Yeah, so the kills in Sleepaway Camp are, especially for a first film, mm -hmm. we haven't seen anything this violent since Nightmare on Elm Street. Yeah, not in a franchise slasher. And Nightmare on Elm Street, even, is still, because it's all dream state -y, Right, gets away with it a little better than... Sleepaway Camp is just... There's a scene, and I know we, we discussed this while watching it, mm -hmm. but there's a scene, this is the first film in a franchise, okay, where the killer puts a hot curling iron right. in a miner's vagina. Not right. a miner like getting coal or, or iron from sure, the earth. I think people know you're a minor like Freddy Krueger minor, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah, I mean, that movie had a lot of really inventive kills. Sure. But the one that always goes... stands out for me in Nightmare on Elm Street is when Johnny Depp gets eaten by the bed. Oh, and sure. And it vomits Absolutely. blood onto well, the ceiling. Or all the stuff from the Dream Warriors, right? Sure. A lot of that, you can play around with these bizarre kills because you're in a dream state. In Sleepaway Camp, these are not supernatural kills. Right. In fact, let's go ahead and commend the series right now for never being supernatural. That's true. It's just a person killing yep. other people. Yep. A hundred percent of the time. And so we have the curling iron one, although that one went a little more artsy than gory. Sure. It did the uh, silhouette shadows sort yeah. of thing. But then there's the, the one with the boiling. Oh, yeah, where the boiling water gets poured on the guy. Yeah, and he right? he just sizzles away on the floor sure. screaming. Sure. And so that is that is just that is one of my favorite things about Sleepaway Camp. The other thing that I like is even if you know the ending, the film painstakingly goes through trying to mislead you and it doesn't do the thing that a lot of films do where it will intentionally constantly mislead you. Pieces did this, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember Pieces back at the... Uh, Music box. But the film is constantly going, maybe it's her cousin. Maybe it's this guy that's into her. It could be this counselor who thinks she's being unjust. It could be Angela, but it's right. probably not Angela. No. Turns out it is Angela, and the reveal is probably more terrifying than anything you could have expected it to be at the end of this film. Yeah, I think the movie sets you up because she's so quiet that she's going to be the survivor girl. Uh -huh. Especially as these movies started coming out one after another, it didn't take very long to realize, all right, we have a final girl. That's just the the formula for the movie. That's how a if somebody is killing, there's going to be a lone girl running away at the mm -hmm. end. And what better lone girl than the quiet mousy one that everyone hates? Yeah, well, she she's finally gets to have her moment where she stands up and becomes a strong, empowered female. Sure. So you're wondering, is that going to be the moment that everyone in the camp, you know, turns to her? Or is she going to do something to save another girl at some point? Or Because it's a strange dynamic that everybody hates her, that mm -hmm. she has no friends. And that's enough of a, an interesting piece of that character for you not to question, you know, you think that's kind of where the hook is, that that's what's going to make this movie a little right. bit different. But of course, Angela is the killer. And so if you're unaware of this twist and you you couldn't heed our warning, of course. Or even if you know the twist and, and haven't seen it. I came to this film having an idea. I mean, you can't do a show like ours and not know about this. People sure. email us about this. Sure. You know, this is just one of those things. I was among the people who knew what the ending was. I believe I'd even seen a clip of it through a documentary mm -hmm. or Google Images. Well, you're, I know you're big into Felissa Rose, and you can't Google her name. I know. I do have this love of Felissa Rose from, uh, and I think it's mostly from you know documentaries. It's a perpetuation of her nerddom is what it is. She is. She's really nerdy, and she's into slashers. And so she shows up in these different, um, I, I can't remember the specific one. I think she was in, uh, there was a really good Jason one. His name was Jason. Yeah, right. Uh, I think she's in that as well as probably some other stuff. And whether that was the specific one that talked about it or not, you know, you just come to find out some of these infamous endings. I'm fairly certain of this, and send us an email and correct me, but I believe Felissa Rose had no idea what the ending of oh, yeah. the first Sleepaway Camp was. 
I don't think she knew that she was being body doubled or, or whatever happened there. I think she just made that great face and then she saw the movie and was just as surprised. She might be the first person who didn't know how Sleepaway right. Camp 1 ended. That's true. But I wasn't prepared for how this was, was actually brought to the, uh, the table right. here. Something about the mixture of... You know what it is? is the movie's mostly playful the rest of the time. And it's kind of blasé about what it's doing. And it's not the sharpest, you know, 80s slasher movie that's ever existed. But when you get to that ending, the tonal shift there mm-hmm. is incredible. Yep. It goes from the sort of movie that could play softball for 10 minutes. Sure. A movie that takes place mostly uh, on a shore in the sunlight mm. with a bunch of fucking dull kids. And then all of a sudden there's one standing there completely naked, only nudity in the sure. movie, really. Completely naked and gory and has a penis yeah and making a terrible face and a growling noise oh god and this the sound she's yep. making right so it, it's angela and that's already kind of oh i guess we're getting confirmation of what was going to become the twist mm-hmm. what everybody kind of realized at this moment but also angela is standing there naked and also she has a penis and the sound the whole thing is sensory overload mm-hmm. there's just too much shit going on at once And the movie exploits that, and it exploits it fucking hard. Yep. So once you know that, and you can go back and watch the movie, that creates a lot of interesting points about what this is as a slasher film. Mm -hmm. You have a a killer who we're sympathetic for through most of the movie. Right. It's not just guess who the killer is, which a lot of these slasher movies do. Sure. Instead, the killer turns out to be somebody we really liked. It wasn't just one of the three people who stand around in the back of the scenes Mm -hmm. and, oh, did it turn out to be the cook or the counselor or... Second ambulance driver? Exactly. It turned out to be the lead who we liked and felt bad. You know, she's awkward and kind of shy and we're sympathetic of her. And you know what? Once she's the killer and she's maiming people, if we have enough of an instant to consider it, I think we would still be sort of sympathetic. Yeah. Sure. You know, they're showing us this this backstory. That's how we kind of know where the movie's going mm-hmm. once that uh, that scene finally happens. And we, she lost her dad. And she was kind of tormented as a kid. And clearly, here she is still being picked on at this camp. Maybe it's okay that she decapitated that young boy. I would never go that far. But it's. Uh, I think that speaks to a lot of what I love about uh, Felissa Rose, too. If yeah. I have to kind of consider what is this newfound obsession I've had even before seeing this movie with Felissa Rose. It's the nerddom, but even as I'm watching this, I feel sympathy, and she kills somebody, and once I know she's the killer, I want to see her kill more people. Yeah. So maybe I'm dwelling on this a little bit, and that's fine, because it's probably my favorite slash. This is, I, it's really my favorite slasher scene. Yeah. Well, I think I can say that hands down. You know, my favorite scene in any slasher movie, and maybe, <laughs> maybe this will make a lot of sense, used to be the ending of the first Jason. Uh-huh. And it's something that, uh, you know, that Hatchet kind of pays tribute to. And a lot of horror movies sure. just steal that moment because it's so great, the end of that first Jason movie. And this feels tonally like the same kind of moment. And by first moments. Jason movie, you mean first Friday the 13th, which is technically is not, not the, the first thing. Jason movie. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's true, right? But the first Friday, the, it, the boat scene. Sure. It's that scene that just hits you really, really fast, and it kind of stays on it for a second, and then the movie just fucking ends. And you're left going, holy shit, I can't believe it. Nothing up to that point even matters. You can't believe that that just happened at the end. And there were so many elements to it. You you just you, sensory overload. And that's what you're left with at the end of this movie. And then you don't get Felissa Rose back, which is a little sad to me. Well, it's it's kind of sad. But at the same time, when we so we get into the second film. And I just want to say right off the bat that I think... The Sleepaway Camp sequels have the best titles. Can I do this? Would you mind? Because I know I always mock yeah, the, uh, absolutely. The, the naming yeah. system. And God, are we going to get into the naming system when we get to a fourth film that is not considered a film because it doesn't exist and how that affects the other numbers. But at least for the first three, they all follow Sleepaway Camp and then a number. Yep. I'm okay with that. And, and afterwards, they have their silly little title. But the titles yeah. are so good. So I will do this series and this series alone the uh-huh. honor of saying this one is called Sleepaway Camp 2 Unhappy Campers. Okay. So I'm going to just say this now. I'm going to acknowledge that I'm saying it and that way we don't have to worry about accidentally making puns during the course of this. Sleepaway Camps 2 and 3 are very campy films. 
that's all. That's I mean, I I, I want to point out that I know that I'm making that. It's not a pun. That is the correct word for that situation. Sure. So we get Pamela Springsteen, who, if you're not familiar with Pamela Springsteen, you're probably familiar with her brother, who is Bruce Springsteen. Sure. That really has no application other than it's kind of weird that Bruce Springsteen's sister plays Angela Baker right. in Sleepaway Camps 2 and 3. But she's great. She's amazing. She's so good. She's yeah. not Felissa Rose, but it's, and we'll discuss it probably when we get to the fifth one. That might be okay. I think it's definitely okay. Because we don't have to, we're not 100% sure about Felissa Rose's capabilities doing stuff. Yeah, and we'll talk about it more during yeah. the fifth film. But she was the shy little girl. Let's sure. just consider only the evidence that's presented to us here. Right. She was the shy girl with not a lot of speaking in the right. previous movie. And uh, and who makes that wonderful face at the end. Right. Felissa Rose does a fine job in the first movie. Uh-huh. But Pamela Springsteen is, you know, as we were talking about, what do you remember about each of these movies? Yeah. I fucking remember Pamela Springsteen sure. about the second movie. Sure. You remember the Happy Camper song? And, oh, and, God. And the Happy Camper song is great to me, not because of its original use, which I think is silly. Sure. But when they slow it down later <laughs> right. on and give her the devil voice. Right. Only at the beginning and end. Right. Because to do that in the song would fuck right. up the bitch. But she's just so happy and bubbly and murdery. She's an icon, man. Yeah. She, this is the point where... Okay, we know she's a slasher. Now, what are we going to do with that? And so she has, I mean, this is a lot of weight on her shoulders. You know, the movie already knows it's being compared now to Freddy and to Mr. Voorhees. Yeah, They have these... Uh, Leatherface, too. That <laughs> fucking chainsaw is great. They have these obvious homages to those other sure. franchises. So rather than just count on the fact that people will see this because it's a sequel and that's just what people do... It has to make this the slasher. We have Mm -hmm. to actually want to follow her. Sure. And it could have relied upon the gimmick of the previous film. It could have talked about that a lot. It could have brought that up in the mythology Uh quite a bit. But it really doesn't touch on it. No. It's mostly just look at this bubbly camp counselor slaughtering these other students in pretty brutal and fantastic ways. Yeah, it's, it's very brutal. And the whole thing is under guise of motivation of, I would say, religious... Sure, like overtones, sure. but it's really not. It's just kind of social accepted overtones because she doesn't like gossips. She doesn't like people who do drugs. She right. doesn't like promiscuous people. Right. She doesn't like people who talk too much. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just about very, very superficially justified when she kills people. But she's always doing it because she thinks that they're not a worthwhile human being. And that's why you come to camp is to... Really figure out if it's worth living. Or to get a drill in your eye. Some of the scenes are gory, but I find that Sleepaway Camp relies a lot more on um, just knowing what happens Mm -hmm. and feeling like that would be a terrible thing. The curling iron is a perfect example. But here, the burned alive scene, I mean, being burned alive would be really fucking awful. Yeah, it would be terrible. by necessity, not really very gory of a death. But the way they do it, to have the the sister sit up directly into the burnt corpse, and then to kind of play on the gore factor by having that paint shot, you Mm -hmm. know, the the direct next scene, which this movie does quite a few times. Right. Might even go so far as to say in all the deaths. Uh, Pretty much. It it does for most of them. I don't know if it does for the, uh, the outhouse kill. The other one I'm thinking of is a gun, no, a drill. Right. And they go to the fake bloody breakfast Mm -hmm. after that. But in this one, you were talking about the the point of view kind of scenes that were set up. And, um, you know, I, I think the best one has to be the first Halloween, right? The opening shot going all the way around the house. Oh, yeah. When it's still, you know, the child. Just one of those painfully laborious scenes mm-hmm. to create. Here we have a point of view shot of the victim. And I, I don't know if I'd say we've never seen that. But it's got to be a rarity, right? Yeah, it definitely doesn't happen as often as it probably should. That's true. Just such a simple concept. The last place you want to be in a car, you know, we've talked about in cinematography before. I think when we did A Clockwork Orange, that's what it was. Uh Where don't you want to be? Where do you want to make, where do you put the camera to make people feel uncomfortable, basically? And in a scene like this, the place you don't want to be is the person's eyeball where the drill is going. Right, exactly. You really don't want to be in the point of view position. So Sleepaway Camp 2 also does something that uh, we always champion these slasher films for doing. And something that Sleepaway Camp 1, I don't want to say neglects to do, but it's probably dangerous for them to do because the actors may or may not be over 18. Well, and given the ending, too. Sure. But in Sleepaway Camp 2, 
all of the all of the little campers who are home from camp after eighth grade that are actually 32 year old men and women right can show their tits sure you get a lot of nudity you get a lot of i mean and and it play and the other thing that's really interesting about it instead of just showing boobs the film plays it into the storyline angela doesn't like seeing boobs right and some of these characters flash boobs for no reason sure the one thing that always stands out to me in this film and i know this is stupid but I'm just hoping that somebody in Podmanity watched this and questioned it. In the scene where the girls do a return panty raid to sure, the boys, sure. first off, they get the shit end of that deal because right. they have to walk out with jock straps. But two, there's this girl, the one who always flashes her tits, right. who says, if you don't give us our bras back, you'll be seeing a lot of this, and then pulls her shirt up as right. if that's a threat. Right. I don't understand that, but I guess it's You're upset just, by this? I, it's not that I'm upset by it. It's just that I'm wondering how that's a threat. And then, it, But I mean, then she turns around and Angela sees her boobs and it's lights out. Ultimately, this movie thinks you won't have time to consider that because, uh-oh, Angela's in the Right. Room. And so she's one of these characters, I don't know that I'd go as far as to say you love to hate her, but it's very clear that she's the antagonist uh-huh. in the film and she's getting in the way of sure. all of the fun. Yeah. Never so far as for her to be the one uh, stopping the audience mm-hmm. from seeing the fun. Right. It's always the aftermath. She always catches people while or after they've had a good time. Sure. Whether it's an outhouse fucking or a panty raid or what have you, everybody gets to have the fun and then Angela catches them. Yeah. So really, they're just being punished right. for the fun they're having and for the fun the audience had by mm-hmm. proxy. The second sleepaway camp also paces itself really well in as far as, you know, which kills are you going to do at what moments and kind of amping that up. Having that moment at the very end where she's really considering the weapons as the other girl talks. Right. You know, once we've got to the point sure. where we kind of know we're not just sending people mm. home, we've put together those pieces. Yeah. Uh, you know, what's kind of weird is this person got sent home and this person and I called them all up and they're not at their home. Yeah. Isn't that weird? Yeah. That's really strange. Right. And, and we Angela, don't give a shit what this girl's saying. Right. And you know, so we're in the other room with Angela. Picking up a lamp and right. seeing if it swings the way she wants it to. Right. Sort of that Pulp Fiction scene sure. that, uh, that we talked about back on the show where we did it with Sin City in the pawn shop selecting which weapon would be the best. And this is fantastic because it does something we seem to talk about on every Killapalooza which is following the slasher as if they are the hero of the story. Mm-hmm. They are our protagonist. And so often, slasher films seem to not have realized that, especially in 1988. Right. Right, to already know, we're all going to this because we love Angela, Mm -hmm. and we want to see Angela butcher people. Mm -hmm. And so we're right there with her, picking up the weapons. I was so happy to find that she was back for the third Sleepaway Camp film. Yeah, which is called, if you will. Sleepaway Camp 3, Teenage Wasteland. Okay, so Sleepaway Camp 3, Teenage Wasteland, does it does about three things... That I think are absolutely glorious. One is it's, uh, I think it's the first slasher film in a franchise. Now, I know My Bloody Valentine does this, but I think this is our first franchise slasher film that has a song about the movie. And it has that metal song where they keep shouting sleep away. Right. And how your parents put their trust in you. Sure. Um, So that one thing that I love. Well, that tie-in became a thing as, you know, you entered the the sort of MTV generation. Sure. Well, Freddie had one with Dream Warriors. Oh, yeah, that's right. And then right. There, was, uh, there was one with Jason as well. And we talked about that a little bit in Reform School Girls. Yeah. But again, 1988, I think this may, this may have had a heads up on everybody else. Sure. So that's one thing that I love about the movie. I think it's a, a silly joke. I all. thought you were going to say this was the first experiment in sharing, which, you know, I love experiments, <laughs> but yeah. not sure that's necessary. That that's actually, I'm, I think that's what I really like about it is this weird idea First off, Angela sneaks back into camp right. by killing some girl uh, with a garbage truck right. and taking her hair and her sunglasses and then becoming a different girl. Totally necessary. But then necessary. she gets to this camp, which is run by this lazy, gluttonous woman and mm-hmm. Michael J. Pollard. From, right. uh, he was in The Wild Angels. He's an old Corman actor, but I mean, you've seen him. He was in House of a Thousand Corpses as well in the intro He's that creepy guy who goes to the bathroom in Captain Spaulding's shop. I was going to say that creepy guy in House of a Thousand Corpses. That really fucking narrows it down. Yeah. But anyway, the whole idea of this camp is that there are some underprivileged, lower class, inner city youths, which right. are all, they're all just human scum. Sure. And then there's upper class, ritzy, 
preppy, obnoxious yuppies that are also human scum. And it's about blending society. It's about sure. blending our variations of scum. Then they separate them all into th- into three camps, which makes the killing easier. This is how I always remember it, is if there's any buildings, it's not Sleepaway Camp 3. They're doing actual legitimate camping. Right. See, when I said I was raised by camp counselors, we just sort of hung out and listened to what was probably Oingo Boingo, which I didn't even realize uh-huh. at the time. Loving that, by the way. Thanks for bringing that You're up. Absolutely. Welcome. I know it took a lot of shows for me to get around to it, but holy shit, Oingo Boingo. Weird Science? Yeah. I almost want to do Weird Science on our show yep. just because I love the theme to Weird yeah. Science. Anyways, what was I saying? Uh, camp Class Warfare. That's what I was talking about. Yeah, it's rap versus country, and mm-hmm. they're actually out and they're doing some legitimate camping. Right. I was not doing any legitimate camping. I was hanging around in a rec center thinking about arcade games. Uh-huh. They have to pitch tents and light campfires. Sure. And they have to do Spray trust paint falls. Stuff. Oh my God, trust falls, Michael. Yeah, and that and the, the trust walking with the blindfold. Just the whole nine yards of real life camping, or what I would imagine is real life camping. Well, that's sort of in the handbook, right? You start talking about your astrological sign, mm-hmm. I guess, right? That's a good conversation starter. Yeah. That's how the experiment in sharing should always start. Right. And uh, what it wasn't it? It was in the last year we all learned that astrology is total bullshit, right? Yeah, I believe it was just within the last few months here. No, it was longer than that because they added a new sign, or rather, didn't. And then the you are you totally oblivious to all this? I have this? no idea what you're talking about. This is about. literally this. This is another one of those points where something is on the news a lot for three or four days, and you don't watch the news. So. Most of the things on the news, not a big deal. Right. Will not affect your life. But you right. are living proof of that. I remember these things that happened. All, kind of like when we talked about the bees mm-hmm. in the happening. It all blows over in three I days. I have no idea what's Nobody. going on in the news. Like, the thing is, is if it doesn't pop up on like the Yahoo homepage or something, I have no idea. I know that there's uh, Japan has got some issues. I know that's going on. I think that's a little bit of old news. No, they just got it. Just I should got cut worse. you off before you get fired from your new gig at Aflac. Okay, sorry. Let's get back to me being mad about trust exercises. Oh, okay. Do you have you ever had to do trust exercises? You know, I is have, there anything and to I these? Tell me about this. So, if people, if oh, let's use the trust fall right because that's the, the okay. funniest example. Yeah. So you fall backwards, I'm supposed to catch you, and if mm-hmm. I catch you a bunch, then you feel like you totally trust me. All right, now does, here's... Does that work? Here's the rationale sure. b- behind trust falls that uh-huh. people don't understand. Is that no one catches you? Well, no, it's No that, one ever catches you, it's right? That That's when the you do When you do a trust fall, if somebody calls out, okay, guys, trust falls, you go, they're going to catch me. I hope they're strong enough to hold me up. Right. It's not about whether or not you trust them to catch you. Cause I, if somebody calls out, Hey, we're doing trust falls. I will always assume they're going to catch me. My fear is not trusting them. It's that I don't know if they can hold my weight. If they're prepared for the situation. Right. Exactly. And the other thing is, is if you do it with a bunch of people, you know, really well, for example, um, me and my roommates are doing like an improv thing. I don't want to talk about it. My one roommate keeps saying, like, keeps opening all of our rehearsals with, let's do some trust falls. And I'm always going, you guys are really good friends of mine. The second you say, let's do trust falls, I question my amount of trust with you. Because if you think we need to strengthen our (laughs) trust by doing trust falls, I think maybe you don't trust me as much as I trust you. And now I'm uncomfortable. Fuck, you were reading into this pretty deeply. That's really what goes on with trust falls, because there's no actual rationale. They don't actually strengthen anything except maybe your forearms. Just team building exercises in general, I'm pretty sure are all bullshit, but I've never seen any amount of skepticism behind that. Yeah. You know, actual uh, study or science. Sure. I think 90% of the room when they hear trust falls groans and, and says, ah, trust falls. But I don't know if we have any hard evidence. I would love to see a study on trust falls. Yeah, maybe bullshit season O. I suppose it's enough, though, that the film's on the right side of the fluoride debate. Uh That's one of my favorite jokes. So, you know, talking about age and doing a lot of drugs. And when I was young, our town didn't have any fluoride in the water. That was fucking great. One of the things the movie brings up is why don't they have any pictures? That's a really good point. And I'm glad somebody asked that. It's almost how a lot of the modern movies have to make a point of showing you that the cell phones don't work. Mm-hmm. Why wouldn't they have pictures of Angela? And so at least they, you know, nobody bring liked her, up. man. She was very unpopular with the campers. I think it's because cameras are considered fun and Angela probably would have killed yeah. you if you had one. It's probably true. 
But those conversations are part of upping the ante where they, you know, they bring in a cop. Sure. So well, they a cop bring in, they now, bring in so. the cop who's the father of the kid whose head was in a TV by the sure. end of Unhappy Campers. Oh, God, we didn't even talk about that set, that grody, disgusting set. That was just fucking perfect. But there's great stuff towards the end of this one, too. You have uh-huh. the, the buried alive lawnmower scene. Right. As if buried alive, not enough, mm-hmm. right? So we're going to add a lawnmower to the mix there, too. And that's one that is just, uh, you know, it's so iconic. It's so what this franchise, what uh, really what Pamela Springsteen is about as Angela. I remember the song from the second movie. I remember it because the third movie shows it again. Uh-huh. That's one of those moments. But I definitely remember singing while filling up the grave and running someone's head over with the lawn. It's just, it's female slasher fun. Yep. It's exploiting the slasherdom. It's exploiting the franchise. It's exploiting Pamela Springsteen. It's exploiting having a fun, happy camper woman. There is an awkward edit in that. And I made a point of looking this up because we were all confused about it when it happened. Mm -hmm. But there were some pretty severe edits made to this movie because of, uh, I'll give you a guess on this one. I'm going to go MPAA. God, fucking MPAA. Yeah, so what they did in editing is basically say, we don't give a shit. Let's cut away as awkwardly as possible. Uh, Maybe not with the foresight to think in years people will watch this and know that we were forced to edit it down. But... I'm not sure. You've just started your foray into editing, uh-huh. which I really wish we would have got your Final Cut conversation oh, yeah. on on, <laughs> uh, on air because it was pretty amazing, your frustration. And it really is terrifying, right? It is. It's absolutely horrifying. Final Cut, fucking, not Final Cut 10, but Final Cut, I guess, 7. Yeah. It's a weird gap there. There's two windows and where does the thing play and rendering, right? The fun of rendering. Oh, my God. But what's a better technique for editing? So you've just made this this glorious artistic piece. You've spent six months, I don't know, three years of your life, whatever, trying to get this mm-hmm. film together. You get it together and it's simple and bloody and amazing. And then the MPAA says, up, oh, got to cut it. So do you go the artistic route? Do you say, let's make some careful edits here so I can maintain some integrity and create... Uh, still a wonderful film that will go out or do you say fuck that noise i'm just going to butcher it terribly so that everyone will know somebody else made me destroy this masterpiece here i you know i think that well so we have my bloody valentine right my bloody valentine the original 80s version right had a lot of severe edits for the mpaa and then when the special edition came out they included them in a version of the film where you sure. can watch it with the excluded material but it's not color corrected. All the lighting's funny. Everything gets weird when it cuts to it. Right, right. So I don't know. I think you just cut it down and try to make it look as decent as possible sure. without losing the effect of the scene. If you have to. I mean, honestly, my first answer is fuck MPAA, release your movie. Yeah, false dichotomy. Yeah. Right. Those are not yeah. the only two options. But if if you feel like you have to do one or the other, you just try to maintain as much integrity as possible. Man, that wasn't a planned segue at all. But the second you said uh, maintain integrity, I remember we forgot to talk about Angela has a gun in this movie. Oh, yeah, that's true. Slasher has a gun. Did Chucky have a gun? Uh, I think he did have Was a gun. Was Chucky the other one? Yeah. I want to say at oh, one Oh, yeah, point. he does. He has a gun in uh, the third one, in the military one. Okay, so this is not unprecedented territory as far as the Killapaloozas uh-huh. go. Still a little weird. It's cheating to have a gun, right? It is cheating. Maybe not if you're a doll, because you're at a major disadvantage. (laughs) Sure, sure. Whatever, if the leprechaun didn't need a gun. The the leprechaun doesn't need to have movies. I think it's come time, then, to talk about Sleepaway Camp 4. The Survivor. The Survivor. I'm going to try and do this, but uh, it's really... The the facts are a little hazy. Everything's kind of weird with this. I mean, basically... The reason its existence is on this Killapalooza sure. is because when the survival kit, which was the first three Sleepaway Camp films, boxed together, right, came out in 2003, 04, 06, something like that. Whatever. They threw in an extra disc of Sleepaway Camp for the Survivor, but it's like the undiscovered footage. Sure. And it's a bunch of shitty, like, running through forest footage, it's which so later sh- ends up to cut a trailer. Yeah, right. Um, But... It's about this film that I guess never got made or hasn't been made yet. See, I would totally disagree with you. I was excited to cover this film just because a film that doesn't exist sounds like an awesome thing to cover. Um, Not because it's necessary, but just because it's weird. 
This footage is in such a shitty state that you, who owns the the survival box set, whatever, uh-huh. didn't even get the disc. No, nope, it didn't it. come with it. That's what you get for buying. It was used, in a asshole. paper sleeve. It's one of those things. You remember when they used to bundle CD-ROM content yeah. with uh, with DVD sets? People on our Facebook group actually offered to send us the entire Sleepaway Camp set so we could watch this and you know talk about it on the show. So this isn't a movie. Or at least as of right this second is not a movie. Right. Now, sources on the internet that shall not be mentioned claim that it's a movie. Right. But until I see it, I don't believe it. Sure. It'll probably be straight to DVD. We're not going to get a theatrical release. Oh, sure. Sleepaway Camp 4, which comes out after Sleepaway Camp 5 and possibly 6. It's a totally different guy from the other movies. Uh, Jim Markovic, who I guess was a big Grindhouse editor. Uh Uh-huh. Right? Did a lot of these movies. Or at least the trailer would have you believe. Well, so he shot a little bit of footage. And I guess they plan to go back and actually finish the movie. Uh, There was a whole script written for it. But... You know, they shot enough footage that when this box set came out, there was about 33 minutes or something like that in there. And so we have an idea of what the movie would be about. Right. Due to whatever conflicts, they never went back and shot the rest of that movie. Mm -hmm. So as far as we know, this 30 minutes is about all they got. All the original material. Yeah. Yeah, we're looking at what amounts to a bunch of unedited dailies, a lot of uh, repetitious... I mean, the fact that they're showing us multiple takes leads me to believe they're really scraping the the barrel here. Yeah, so essentially all of the footage gets cut to a trailer for a film whose plot is this. A girl who may or may not be Angela Baker from the first Sleepaway Camp movies Mm -hmm. has bad dreams or nightmares about camp, goes to a doctor... Doctor tells her, maybe you should go back to sleepaway camp sure. to discover some repressed memories you have of what went on there. I know this is becoming my motto, but why wouldn't you? Yeah. So she goes to sleepaway camp, which in the footage looks like a forest. Sure. And Sleepaway preserve more than sleepaway sure, camp. Sure. And she runs afoul of a police officer and then makes friends with a hunter. And well, they, I guess they're on bad terms. Is that yeah? Kind of I think what they're I, on bad terms with each other. A lot of this didn't even have audio associated with sure. it, so we're really trying to piece it together based on uh, you know a work print that mm-hmm. came out um, that I haven't even seen the work print. Right. All I've seen is this footage. I yeah. assume that's the same for yourself. Yeah, absolutely. So write ups of a work print, sure, and then these you know very basic details you can right. get out of this. And so she starts regressing and realizing that she was at sleepaway camp when the original massacres were happening. Right. And still doesn't know if she was Angela Baker, but starts kind of feeling like she's Angela Baker maybe. Right. Because the, I think the idea was that the cops sort of attacked her. Right. Or wanted to fuck her in that really weird scene. Yeah. Shot. Right. And the hunters kind of defending her. And so her sort of animalistic, you know, as, as these killings start happening, Mm -hmm. Then she starts to wonder, all right, am I Angela? Sure. At this point in the film, from my understanding, it cuts back to a greatest hits of the first three Sleepaway Camp movies. And then finally she meets two campers who are hanging out in the preserve, a man and a woman who kind of, I guess, want to help her, but feel like she might be a little crazy. Right. The woman then kills the man and the girl, and turns out the woman camper was actually Angela. And that's, I mean, I don't know how the film wraps itself up. We've now spoiled up, a film that doesn't even exist. But that's how it goes. So what's pretty amazing is I guess this was always the story. Mm-hmm. As much as I can, you know, understand and if what everybody says is to be believed, they always intended this to be a kind of greatest of, of the, the previous movies. You know, this running collection of here's a bunch of scenes that we're thinking back to. And, I, you know, I guess these would be the nightmares she's having, our excuse for watching these scenes through the movie. It's really fitting that this guy was a Grindhouse editor because we've already cut a trailer out of Mm -hmm. 30 minutes of footage for a movie that wasn't even finished. Somehow managed to do that. Right. And there's kind of a couple trailers floating around on the internet. But his plan was to use previous footage from other films, something that's basically never done in a way that feels okay. Mm -hmm. How many times have we complained about that? Every time we see a trailer, really. Well, I just meant in slasher movies about bringing up the previous movie and then showing the scenes from it. Oh, yeah. Giving a sort of previously on Jason. That's, yeah. Or which franchise Uh, was it that did a lot of that? um, Wishmaster? Oh, my God. Leprechaun. Doesn't matter. They all did it. it. Just, it's terrible. Going back to the earlier films is just a big no no in Slasherdom. Yeah, you can't just reshow the footage. It's so fucking cheap. At least reimagine the footage, right? right? 
but don't reimagine the whole fucking movie. See, these are very strict rules you have mm. to follow to not upset slasher fans. Right. I think the best the best guidelines for uh, making a slasher movie is if it starts with re, don't do it. Reboot, remake, resample. Reimagine. So I'm not sure what else they'd plan to shoot then. Maybe they were actually going to kind of reshoot a couple of these scenes as well as show them from the previous movie. But in the power of editing, this director said, you know what, I can actually put together a movie if I just cleverly edit some of the old scenes in with the only half hour of footage I had. So I guess that's where the work print came mm-hmm. from. And, you know, this thing made its rounds and the uh, the producer of the series ended up seeing it and said, all right, you know what, we got to we got to just finish this product. Sure. Well, he basically point, gives them permission to use the, the footage from the previous three films. He doesn't say finish finish the movie. He says, well, yeah, if you want to cut our stuff <laughs> sure. into it, sure, just show me what you got. They're really not going to incur any cost at yeah, this point, right? Yeah. So uh, it's my understanding that they put together some narration, some voiceover here, and uh, that kind of leads you. I mean, if you have narration, you can fucking do anything. Yeah. With well, narration footage. narration is Grindhouse 101. That's why so many of those trailers are so awesome, is the narration. Right. How great would that be if all of Sweepaway Camp 4 is actually narrated in Grindhouse fashion? That would be amazing. With the voice? Oh, that's totally not the case, is and it? And then it turns out that the voice was Angela Baker all along. How do I know so much about Angela Baker? Because I am Angela Baker. Rated X. The other concern was that they didn't have enough deaths, or probably any deaths, really. It doesn't look but like we didn't any see deaths. the deaths, so I'm going to assume they didn't exist. It looks like there's five actors in the movie, so I don't see how many deaths you could possibly incur. So I think their plan was, or is, or, or what have you, to make CGI deaths. Which, I mean, this is a very bizarre movie we're creating. So in its current form, and apparently this exists... And uh, I wouldn't be surprised if it just showed up one day. Maybe even by the time we post this episode, that would be awkward. Or uh, 10 years down the line. Uh But in its present form, it's about an hour and 10 minutes. So thumbs up already. And it seems like a completed story. Now, this makes it even weirder because if it came out today, this would really be a lost film coming out. Mm -hmm. They didn't reshoot a bunch of stuff that they already shot to make it look modern. This is going to look like an 80s slasher film. It's going to come out and no one will have seen it. They even made a fucking poster for the thing already. 80 slasher movie just coming out 2011, 2012, 2013, whatever. Nobody's seen it before. Modern day CGI effects on top of it's, it's going to be weird. Certainly one of the stranger projects I can think of. I think one of the uh, other stranger projects I can think of is bringing Robert Hiltzik back in 2008 with almost the same cast and a really fat, dirty kid. Now we call it Sleepaway Camp 5 because that makes the sure. previously mentioned film more awesome. But it's actually called Return to Sleepaway right. Camp. So we're kind of pretending the other movies don't exist. Sure. Or that's what you see in the official synopsis yeah. everywhere. Although I don't know if necessarily... It isn't necessary to assume that they don't exist, except for the fact that back in... In the beginning of Sleepaway Camp 2, there's like talk about a mental institution and a sex change and sure. this, that, and the other thing. All you would have to think is that somebody is lying, which yeah, they already are that's all true. over the film anyways. Sure. And it's it's back to the same camp, so it's like that doesn't matter. We get Paul D'Angelo back, who plays Ronnie, who is, I mean, if you didn't think he pointed too much in Sleepaway Camp, <laughs> sure, sure. man, he brings those fingers out. This would be like doing a Rocky Horror sequel today. Yeah. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Or some kind of, it's almost a remake, but not really. Sure. For Rocky Horror. Yeah. Uh, modern day with Tim Curry starring. Yeah, sure. That's kind of right. what we're looking at. And get a cameo from South Park character. We're bringing back, oh God, that's weird too. We're bringing back a lot of this cast, the crew, the uh, the creator of the original uh, somebody who I don't think has done a lot since he did yeah, Sleepaway Camp. I don't. I think he's primarily associated with Sleepaway Camp. He just decided, God damn it, I'm going to do Sleepaway Camp Five. He got bored, came up with an idea. You know what he did? He probably came up with, you know, what would be awesome if there was a bunk bed and the top bed had a bunch of nails coming out of it, and a killer jumped onto the top bed and flattened the person laying underneath <laughs> sure, right. with sharp nails. At the risk of sounding much like the conversation around The Expendables when that came out, this is sort of an 80s film if it were made today. It absolutely is. That's it's, not unfair, right? No, it's not. It's it's very similar to House of the Devil. 
in the way it looks. Sure. Except sure. it's not that kind of 80s film. It's not a serious 80s film. It's an 80s slasher film. Right. Made in the 2Ks. So where the House of the Devil was paced and brooding, um, Sleepaway Camp is simple and cheap and 80s. And fun. Now, certain elements they chose to really heighten. So by heightening different elements of what you remember an 80s film to, to be like, you would have very different effects. Oh, yeah. So I don't think you could say this is the end result. If you made an 80s film today, this is what it would look like. Uh, simply because we've just mentioned The House of the Devil, which I guess was not 80s, but you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. Uh, or The Expendables. It's almost, you know, thinking about the prequels of Star Wars. Right. How everybody has this memory of what Star Wars was at the time. And when the prequels came out, there was a lot of argument over, well, come on, you guys, this was actually the same shit we were getting back then. We just all feel nostalgic about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's a a really cynical way of looking at it, but I'm not about to get into a huge Star Wars debate. Mm -hmm. That was obviously the way George Lucas looked back at the original Star Wars and Mm -hmm. what he he felt like he was making movies that lined right up. Yeah. And a lot of other people looked at him and said, how could you even consider these the same type of films? And so that's the result we're getting with Sleepaway Camp. You're either going to look at this and say, yep, 80s film goes right with the other ones, or you're going to say, how the fuck are you expecting me to sit through this? Right. And I understand the position of people who might look at this film and have a really hard time. There is something that kind of grinds against me for about the first uh, 60% of the movie. I think it's that there are no likable characters. That's probably Everybody what it sucks, is. Everybody except sucks, for, except for, again, Ronnie. I think Ronnie is, is always okay. Yeah, see, I wouldn't say no likable characters. I would just say everybody sucks. Yeah. I think that's really, that's getting to the heart of the problem. Mm-hmm. Fuck these people. Right. Fuck all of these people. Who are these people? Who likes these people? Who hangs out with these people? They're not only all rejects, but I hate them. I mm-hmm. hate every one of them. <laughs> Except, uh, strangely, that cop with the voice thing. Oh, yeah, that cop is really, it's a righteous cop, always there in the nick of time. So you might be thinking that this is where I'm going to start talking about how I love Felissa Rose again. But instead, let's talk about everything this movie steals from South Park. Yeah. Weird. Well, certainly it's, it steals a big red shirt, an apron, and some blue jeans. Yeah, that's also, the less, uh, less subtle stolen material. A chef played by Isaac Hayes called The Chef. He does everything short of making salty chocolate balls. It's really... So this is Isaac Hayes' last role, which is funny to me. A lot of people look at that and think it's sad because he Mm -hmm. had this career and whatever. And Isaac... I just think... I think it's funny. But it's a red shirt and an apron that really should say chef on it. Uh I think if they wrote the word chef on it, it would be copyright infringement. Yeah, but would South Park really sue them? This is hilarious. I had no idea that this existed, that that there was a real-life version of the cartoon chef. (laughs) Or that there was a mildly different version of Ned from South Park. Right. Both in the same movie. So I won't talk much about the fat kid and how I hate him and I want to punch this film in the face. I think it's the dirt, too. He's He's just gross. These scenes are kind of like watching snot run out of someone's nose at 24 frames a second. Right. But there are moments that are so extremely effective that it makes it makes it worth getting through. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm thinking about that, uh, that boiling scene, the yeah. frying scene, the I guess, in this scene. movie. There's a lot of tension there. I mean, a lot. The music is already kind of agitating, but it's insane how good of an effect that is. It's really one of my favorites. He's being held over that deep fryer, and, you know, 10 or 20 seconds in, you would usually, he'd fall in, and that would just be what happened. But this scene seems to go on for an eternity, and it really does get more effective as it goes on. It feels worse and worse. And then when he finally goes in and comes back out, his face, it, just seeing it fucked up and yep. bubbly, and uh, it just makes everything worse. It's terrible. It, it works so well. Well, all the kills in this movie are are right back to the gross, insanely gory. The one that I always like. I, I mean, I mentioned the bed one. That's mm-hmm. probably my sure, favorite. Sure. But close second for me is the sharpened broomstick. Oh, right. Through the hole yeah. in the floor. It's an example of this movie milking the kills for all they're mm-hmm. worth. I mean, every kill, Absolutely. especially the, uh, if I called it the snip and toss scene, would people know what I'm talking about? I think they, they ought to. That might not be vulgar enough. It's the one where the guy's cock is pulled off of his body mm-hmm. and then drugged down the highway. Sure. Which is immediately followed up by a woman who gets wrapped in barbed wire at 45 miles an hour. Yeah. And that whole sequence goes on for, it's longer than the fucking softball sequence. It is. And sometimes that's agonizing to watch. Well, it's always agonizing to watch, sometimes in a good way, I guess I should say, and sometimes not. 
Uh, but uh, sometimes it's really amazing. The the ice beer scene you were talking about uh-huh. is just so, it's so playful and it's so perfect. I love they keep looking through that hole and you're right? like, who's going to get it in the eye? When's it going to happen? Every time they lean over it, you're thinking, don't do that. Right. Stop leaning over the hole. It's not just anybody who's seen a slasher film. Any human being right. watching this movie knows when they see a spear coming out of the ground and someone goes, oh, I should put my eye up to that. <laughs> you're just screaming at it the whole it 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 borders on paying tribute the way something like trick or treat did sure but i think anybody really gets this the whole time you're squealing at it if the people had managed to stay in the theater theater this movie didn't come out in theaters if people had managed to stay in the room long enough to get to this point in the movie i don't see how anybody isn't loving it at yeah, this point yeah absolutely and i mean the last kill in the whole movie is that boy who's skinned laying on the floor yeah, gurgling right. and bleeding it's one of the grossest most obscene images surrounded by skinned frogs really disgusting just yeah. mixing uh disgusting almost trauma style sure. disgusting moments and 80 slasher stuff i guess even the nasty stuff i'm not going to complain about my only complaint oddly, is around Felissa Rose. Uh Uh-huh. And it's amazing and a complaint at the same time. Right. So perhaps what got me up to this point in the movie and why I'm I'm having no problem here is because I know it's fucking Felissa Rose. In the cop suit? Yeah. The second I see the cop. Well, come on. He's it's literally like if it was the Unabomber, it would be less of a disguise. Uh Yeah. Huge glasses, hat, obviously fake beard. And not fake like shitty budget film fake. But fake like Lost Season 2 fake. Right. Fake like we just found your shit in a cupboard with some glue fake. So you know there's something up with the cop. Now, I don't know right away what's going on. And there's a a couple scenes to throw you off. And the movie, it's so obviously written by the person who did the first one. Because it tries to do the same twist. Yeah, it tries to play off that it's this person and that person. But but never actually, unlike the first film where I feel like there's a moment where it kind of teases maybe it is Angela... Return to Sleepaway Camp always uses the cop as, like, a tertiary character who shows up and does some stuff, but isn't actually in the movie. Sure. It almost tries to set up the cop as a second ambulance driver. Right. But because there are so few characters in the film that the cop still has weight and lines. Yeah, you know who your pretty direct options are, and then you wonder who are the three people we talked about standing around in the background. Right. And the cop is one of those people. And if it's not Isaac Hayes, and it's not the cop... And it's not the dude who wasn't killing people in the first movie of points at everything. I mean, really, who is it? And so I cheated a little bit because I knew Felissa Rose right. comes back. And I'm just expecting her to show up at the end. The scene that throws me is when the cop is talking to her brother. Uh-huh. Also came back, also kind of weird. Same actor, looks like white trash version of Eli Roth. So then there's the killer wearing the hoodie. The other uh, kind of pay no attention to the cop sure. wearing the fake beard that's obviously movie fake. Now, this upsets me because for a second, uh, this is before I realized that it's Felissa Rose. I'm thinking, okay, that's Felissa Rose. Uh-huh. We haven't seen Felissa Rose yet. She is the killer because right. that, sure. because I imagine this, this director, this writer just hangs out with the five people from the first movie that right. he put in this movie as well. And so if this is going to keep paying tribute the way it has, Felissa Rose is clearly in the film. Mm-hmm. I don't know why she's not the lead fucking character instead of this fat kid. So she's wearing the the scream hoodie. Uh Then it becomes obvious that the cop is the killer because the the killer has to be someone in the camp. They're not going to show you who the person in the hoodie is. Mm -hmm. And this is the point that I'm both delighted and no longer have a problem watching these uh, agitating scenes because I know I'm watching Felissa Rose in a movie. She's in the movie in two roles, and neither of which you get to look at her beautiful, wonderful face. Right. You you really, you see her as a cop, and you see her as a hooded figure, which honestly might not be her. Probably isn't her, right? I would assume is, for the kind of movies that Felissa Rose has done, and believe me, I have looked through her filmography, I was thinking to myself, you know what? Fuck you, Sleepaway Camp 5. I'll just watch a movie that actually stars Felissa Rose. Good luck finding one of those that's watchable. Yeah. They all look like they were filmed... On uh, circa 1990s, you know, you home camcorder. While you're watching, <laughs> you the could movie. hear the VHS tape winding. Yeah. Really, they just seem so painful, and I'm sure I'm going to watch about half of them, anyways. That's a shame. You know, it's bad when you look up. You know, in horror, you've seen as many movies as we've talked about on the show or watched off the air, and you look up somebody's um, horror kind of filmography, 
And it looks the way you and I have described these actors we're not aware are in all of these movies that we've never heard. It's a realm of film that right. we weren't aware of. Right. We're very aware of this realm yeah, of, of movies true. here. And she's been in about 200 fucking movies since uh, the year 2000. Mm-hmm. And I have never heard of any of them. Yep. Never even heard of any of them. Yeah. Not one. And they're not like Sleepaway Camp homages. They're just weird horror movies her friends made. Anyways, back to my point. My point uh-huh. was that Felissa Rose is in this movie, this whole fucking movie, and I'm enjoying it because I'm like, hey, that's Felissa Rose, but you don't get to see her except for five seconds at right. the end. You see her at the end when she comes out and has been killing everybody and then... Makes the face the that creepy, she poses with everyone. The creepy laughing <laughs> face and then cuts to the blank stare. I mean, it would have been as if the entire first Sleepaway Camp, rather than pasting her head on someone else's body had just starred that body the entire mm-hmm. film. Right. And then at the end, what a twist, pace her head on it. Sure. It just enraged me, but I'm not actually enraged until sure. the point where I see her and realize there's five seconds left. This is all right. the Felissa Rose I'm getting. See, the point that I, I felt would enrage you more is the fact that every time it fades to black, it doesn't actually cut to a commercial. It just cuts to more Sleepaway Camp 5. I'm starting to wonder, you know, obviously this didn't make its way to theaters, but did they make it for TV? I I'm, mean, it's edited like it's a made-for-TV movie. Yeah, but I don't know how many dicks you can pull off on uh, network or cable television. Yeah, that's probably true. Maybe this director's just been working a lot in, in TV. Or fading. Maybe he's just working a lot in fading. It's still wonderful. I'm blindsided when I see her. I, I love... am so giddy, so happy about it. I mean, is it a great... I love Sleepaway Camp 5. I know it sucks and that kid's fucking dirty, but... <laughs> it's, it's true. It sucks and that kid is dirty. But God, what a great fucking Felissa Rose. While the ending is never going to top the original, yeah. because the ending of no slasher film will ever top the original Sleepaway Camp... That uh, that laugh that just goes on uh-huh. and on and her face and that wide open smile and then just stares at the camera. Cut to red. Yep. Cut to black. Fucking awesome. I'm, I'm literally excited just yeah, thinking I, about no, it. No, right I can now. tell. I can tell. So two things that I thought were really amazing now that we're done with all of these Sleepaway Camp films. And uh-huh. I guess this is kind of spoiler territory. The slasher doesn't die in every movie. Right. How Actually, weird the slasher is that? Uh, never, never dies. Never dies. I mean, that's kind of debatable. There's a moment in the, well, I won't even say what movie, but the slasher doesn't fucking die. Yeah. And we're not well, that talking. Goes back to, that goes back to what you said in the very beginning, where it never goes supernatural. Sure. If Angela were to die, if someone were to kill Angela, unfortunately, sequels would have to stop being made. Yeah, I guess that's true. Yeah, that's what keeps it extremely natural. Even with Jason or Michael Myers, mm-hmm. there has to be at least a tiny supernatural. Sure. They you know, operate the... within physical sure. boundaries. Right, right. But you can't kill them. And when you do kill them, because they die every fucking movie, the studios bring these guys back to life somehow, whether it's peeing fire on them or or what have you. Usually peeing fire. Still the most ridiculous resurrection of any slasher. But here our slasher makes it out alive every Mm -hmm. time. There's no moral of the story. There's no vaguely there's no conclusion the conclusion is everyone's dead yeah we just actually finished kill i guess that should also be said too basically every time we kill the entire cast right there's no survivor girl here we kill everybody yeah and the only one that survives is the slasher she wins these are among the things that make angela really my favorite slasher yeah you know it would be really bold to call this the best slasher franchise or i'm not going to say anything absurd like that Sleepaway Camp is one of uh, one of more of the oddities. A, a mm-hmm. lot of people aren't, you know, it's not borderline McDonald's toy material like Jason Voorhees is. Right. This isn't a uh, a Halloween costume that sure. people have every year. This is fucking Sleepaway Camp. But still, franchise aside, this uh, this just has to be my favorite slasher. And I think the franchise too should be given a lot of credit because this is. You know, really one of the most feministic uh, kind of series, I I guess it tops Freddy, right? Mm -hmm. The Freddy movies were movies where, you know, the females combated the killer in every movie. Mm -hmm. It was never a movie about running away. I mean, thinking back to almost all of those movies, obviously there's the second one that had the really awkward sexual overtones, right? They're just tones at that point. Uh But most of the other movies, the Nancy stuff... It's all, all right, here's Freddy, here's the story on Freddy, we need to hunt him down and kill him. Fuck, Freddy versus Jason was like that. Yep. The Dream Warriors is all, mm-hmm. you know, hunt down and kill Freddy, and obviously he's still a menace, and that's part of the great balance of A Nightmare on Elm Street, 
is that you have a scary slasher who's always winning, but not for long. Right. right? There's always a plan. Sure. And so that naturally portrays all of these women as great protagonists. Mm-hmm. They're always smart. They're, you know, they're clever. They have to come up with these plans. They know the things. I mean, all these kids know the things their parents don't know. So even though that was still about butchering young girls yeah. and vaguely about pedophilia uh-huh. at points, I thought that was probably, I mean, if you want to make a call, like feminism, slasher movies, yeah. that's probably where you go, right? That would be pretty much up there. Except for Sleepaway Camp, mm-hmm. where we have the female slasher. We have her completely empowered through especially the second and third movies, right. where she is on top of her game. Nothing even comes close. There isn't even really a moment right. where you think that maybe this is it for her. Uh-huh. I uh, I didn't even realize until after we'd watched this entire franchise that she never dies, that she always wins. Yep. I was thinking back to these other slashers and they're, you know, the interesting sort of deaths and resurrections always part of the, the franchises. And that's when I realized we have none here because Angela always fucking wins, thusly by default, making her best slasher ever. <laughs> No debate on that, I'm sure. I guess that's true. We have a website. We haven't mentioned it in a while, but we revised the site. We're slowly revising the site. Mm-hmm. I didn't really want to say anything because I don't want people to see it while I'm tweaking right. it. I think it looks mildly presentable at this point. Doublefeatureshow.com. Go to that and look at all the fun new things that yeah. as year four comes around will make more sense. Sure. Speaking of year four, also, uh, this is the last time we're going to say this, donations. Yeah, so now I, I, we're not going to stop taking donations. We will never stop taking donations. We really need them. But yeah, we actually do. And it's it's been amazing that you guys have really stepped up in... in uh, so you guys are technically the actual producers of the show. Sure. Um, we have three or... F- we have a slew of uh, the usual suspect style producers, depending on what crime we're uh, ac- accusing <laughs> them for. Beautiful. But... You guys actually produce the show, but what we're going to do now is now you get nothing for donating other than the show. <laughs> um, the prize of getting in for the, the year end show where we were taking the donations and people in the list. I don't have to explain it anymore either. No, you don't. Uh, you really don't. This is all you have to say. Seven more days. Seven more days. Once the next show, if you were planning, you've been listening every week and you've been uh, hearing us say... Donate to the show, and maybe you can pick the last movies. That's coming up. This is the end of our, I keep wanting to say fiscal year, but we don't sure. have any fucking right. money. This, this show is the end of the telethon. No goddamn budget. This is the end of the telethon. If you are hearing this right now, and you have not donated, which, again, seriously, thank you to everyone. It's insane that we're able to run a show with the production values we have off of donations. We absolutely could not do this, and year after year, You've basically been keeping the show afloat. That's insanely cool. Yep. I can't get over how cool that it's is. It's amazing. So as we move into the fourth year and we're starting to plan a bunch of stuff and try and budget that out and pay for servers and all that crap, we have uh, now one last week that we're going to try and drive for donations. So if you would still like to have a chance to pick the final movies this year, double feature, two people are going to pick some movies. We're going to pair one of each of them together create a super awkward double feature and you're hearing the sound of our voices this is the last time to do that do that now as of midnight next thursday we will have you know there'll be another show out and we'll uh be emailing all those people and we'll be figuring out what to do in the year end so you have until the next episode of double feature goes up send a donation it's donate.doublefeatureshow.com we still need money for year four (laughs) donate.doublefeatureshow.com still fuck so as we're doing all this talking about the end of the year, the year would not be over without a John Waters film. That's true. And me making you watch some artsy shit. Yeah, with Nicole Kidman, I believe. Oh man. Yeah. So this is going to be uh this is going to be a really interesting one. We have uh what are the movies? We're doing To Die For and Serial Mom. That's it. To Die For and Serial Mom. These just seem like movies that go correctly together. Yeah, I'm going to have to the, trust you on that. Where the puzzle pieces fall, I suppose. Um, to Die For is uh, Nicole Kidman and Gus Van Sant. Uh-huh. It's a very strange film. And Serial Mom is, uh, it's its a fairly usual John Waters affair. Yeah. But there's also some fucking bizarre things about that. And so we're just going to keep with the women doing the slashing. I'm totally okay with that. Sounds like a good time. Watch more fucking film. Bye.